I am a direct beneficiary of so many other people's courage that came before me in the workplace. You know, as a black woman, the work that I get to do, the stages that I get to stand on, the access and privilege that I hold, many of my ancestors, many of the elders didn't get these opportunities. I stand on their courage, even in the jobs that I get to hold. And so for me, it was like, who's going to be a beneficiary of my courage? And so when you think about it from that lens, I was like, oh, I have to talk. I have to use my voice and rather five people benefit from it or 500,000. It's always worth the one. Hi, listeners. Thanks for joining. This is the Visible Voices podcast, and I'm the creator and host, Risa E. Lewis. Today's guest is Minda Hartz, and I am going to read to you a little bit about her bio. Minda is an author, a public speaker, a podcaster, and a workplace consultant. She's written three best-selling books, The Memo, Right Within, and You Are More Than Magic. And in today's episode, we are talking a bit about The Memo, but mostly about Right Within. So Minda first came on my radar when my co-author, Dr. Adara Landry, and I started looking for comp titles, comparative titles of our book that's coming out in 2024, Microskills. And one of the comp titles is The Memo, where Minda speaks about toxic workplaces and toxic workplace environments and how to navigate those environments and how to be better at work. When we get to the conversation, Minda and I are talking about the experiences she's had in the workplace. Okay, I told you, my introduction to Minda Hartz was the memo. And in preparation for today's conversation, I really did a deep dive into Right Within. And there's so much with which I resonated, so many smart suggestions. And I was struck by your decision to tell your story. And podcast is called The Visible Voices. And so I would like to know what made you say to yourself, self, I'm going to tell my story. The time is now. Uh, You know, that's a great question. Really, I feel like I had to. Like, there was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And I think it's almost, I liken it to a genie in a bottle. So once you kind of open up that top, you can't put yourself back in the bottle. And once I started to talk about just what it's like to be a Black woman in the workplace, a woman of color in the workplace, the inequalities that, you know, women face, I realized that my voice was actually tied to someone else's freedom. And so if I'm quiet, then the people that need to hear my story, that need to find their freedom so they can help someone else find their freedom, my voice is for the ecosystem. Your voice is for the ecosystem. And so I realized that I had to get myself out of the way because Minda, she's more introverted. She's more shy. She would rather, you know, enter a room and sit in the back and nobody bother her, right? She can just enjoy. But I realized that being part of changing uh, status quo, it's going to require you to move to the front. It's going to require you to put your hand up. And once I realized that it's not just for me, but it's for current and future generations, it made it a little bit easier to say, how do I want to use my voice, not just for myself, but for others as well? I love uh, my smile. My giggle has nothing to do with the seriousness of our conversation and your words and your journey and your experience. It's because you referred yourself in the third person. And Risa often refers to Risa in the third person. Risa also identifies as introverted. And audience listeners are thinking Minda is a shoe in for Risa's podcast because the name of the podcast is The Visible Voices. So I always ask my guests, and I'm going to ask you now, when did you realize you had a voice? When did you start using that voice? Those two times are often a bit different. Yeah, I mean, they are a bit different. I realized that I had a voice when I felt like I had lost it, right? So I often make the statement that we all have a voice. We just have to decide when we want to use it. And I used to say, oh, I've lost my voice in the workplace. I can't find it and those sorts of things. And then I realized, wait a second, no one could take that away from you. You have the power to reclaim your agency, reclaim your voice. You just decide what makes sense for you. And it was around 2012 when I realized that I don't know where it had gone, right? And I need to start to figure out how to use it. But it wasn't until 2015 until I actually started using it. And going back to your previous question, it was really important for me. Again, I didn't want to leave the workplace the way I found it. And so that's when I realized that I am a direct beneficiary of so many other people's courage that came before me in the workplace. You know, as a Black woman, the work that I get to do, the stages that I get to stand on, the access and privilege that I hold, many of my ancestors, many of the elders didn't get 
these opportunities. I stand on their courage, even in the jobs that I get to hold. And so for me, it was like, who's going to be a beneficiary of my courage? And so when you think about it from that lens, I was like, oh, I have to talk. I have to use my voice and rather five people benefit from it or 500,000. It's always worth the one. Yeah. You have a great story you've shared. And if I can be so bold to suggest that this is one of perhaps the elders and the voices who inspired you, that's Toni Morrison. Yes. Toni Morrison is definitely one of the elders that her and Audre Lorde, I I take them everywhere I go. (laughs) And, you know, Toni Morrison said, write the book you want to read. And that's what was the impetus for writing the memo. And what a lot of people don't know is Three years before I got my book deal for the memo, I actually met Toni Morrison. I had the opportunity to go to her home in upstate New York. And had you have told me that day that one day you would be a best-selling author, I would have never guessed. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. How was that meeting? You know, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. And um, I'm just so thankful for her voice, right? Because she gave many of us permission to be able to talk about things that were considered taboo to center experiences of people who often, you know, are underrepresented or underestimated. And so having that moment with her, it was amazing. Like spending two hours with Toni Morrison, I I hold on to that every day of my life. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You have to think back, did that really happen? I'm going to briefly share that I had a similar experience with Gloria Steinem and I was recording with her and She's like, oh, you know, just go into the kitchen and get yourself some water. I'm like, am I going to go into Gloria Steinem's kitchen and just go get some water? And, you know, she was eating a muffin. She's like, do you want some? And it was like, it was just so surreal. But tying it back to voice, I asked her the question about voice. And she said, well, you have a voice. Why wouldn't you use it? And I think it was as I was navigating this concept of voice. And this brings me to a question I have for you with voice, using your voice and putting your story to paper. What was and what is your relationship to fear? Fear of consequences, fear of, you know, negative feedback or fear that something's going to happen because you're telling your authentic story? Yeah, I I was definitely fearful, a lot of fear, because when the memo came out, there weren't any other books like it at the time talking about race and gender in the ways that I did. And I was nervous about that because prior to putting the book out, you know, I would meet different investors or different people would hire me and say, you know what, you do so much better if you didn't talk about race. And, (laughs) and that was the moment where I'm like, you know what, I'm going to keep on talking about race because it's making people uncomfortable, but it's allowing so many more people to feel seen. And so again, taking my feeling out of it and saying, how can I make this better for people who haven't been centered? And so I was scared, but I often think about it from this perspective is I let my curiosity be larger than my fear. What if this book does well? What if it changes the dynamics inside the workplace? What if a woman of color finally feels seen and doesn't think that she's validated, right? What if our managers read it and they become better humans in the workplace? You know, there were so many more curiosities for me that, you know, essentially trumped any fear of what that is. And, and sometimes fear has to drive us to change. You know, you think about, again, the ancestors, the elders who fought in many different spheres and it was their courage, right? They knew that there was adversity, but they thought about us. They thought about the future and they said, you know, this will benefit them. Continuing with this concept of fear, did you ever worry that Carrie would recognize herself in your book or James would recognize himself in the book? You know what? I <laughs> I probably was more fearful of Carrie and James recognizing themselves in the book because at the time I was still living in New York and Carrie, her portfolio of work was still in New York. And so I'm like, oh my God, we're going to run into each other in one of these, you know, Goldman Sachs lobbies or something like that. And I'm sure by now she knows that she's Carrie. <laughs> Somebody has told her she knows. And then I just had to let that go again. I'm like, you know what? Carrie shouldn't have been being Carrie. James shouldn't have been James. <laughs> I can't control that, right? And those things that get in our way. And I just said, you know what? So many more people have benefited from the Carrie and James story. So I'm putting my stake in the ground on that. 
100%. So listeners are now feeling like, wow, Risa and Minda are having this like inside conversation. I have no idea what they're speaking about. So let's do a little bit of a deep dive into Right Within. And what I'd like to do is start by reading some definitions that come from the book and come from some of your writings to sort of orient the audience to Right Within. First, I'm going to use a working definition of healing. Healing is a process that is individualized and that is about moving forward towards wholeness and authenticity. And then this brief excerpt that comes from page 61 of the copy that I had of Right Within. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, mental hygiene is the science of maintaining mental health and preventing the development of psychosis, neurosis, or other mental disorders. And this is you now. I know what you might be thinking. Is racial trauma a mental disorder? I don't know the clinical answer to that, but when I experienced traumatic race-related situations in the workplace, it led to the deterioration of my mental health. The trauma I was experiencing manifested in the form of panic attacks, anxiety, and depression. I should note that the American Psychological Association refers to racial trauma in this way. Many ethnic and racial groups experience higher rates of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, as compared to white Americans. One explanation for this is the experience of racism, which can itself be traumatic. According to the Mayo Clinic, PTSD is a mental health condition that's triggered by a terrifying event, either experiencing it or witnessing it. Symptoms may include flashbacks, nightmares, and severe anxiety, as well as uncontrollable thoughts about the event. And this is you again. I'm not certified in anything other than being a Black woman, but what I do know without a shadow of a doubt is that racial trauma ain't healthy for any of us. Period. (laughs) That's it. Yeah. I mean, you know, your listeners who were listening to the conversation and thinking, you know, maybe some people are like, it's not real. It's, you know, racism or isms. But we know that anything that strips us away of our dignity, strips us away of our humanity, strips us away of equity is damaging, right, to the psyche. But if you're constantly in a state of panic and trauma, eventually that's going to start to erode your well-being, erode your mental hygiene, right? And I think because we've normalized these inequalities in the workplace, we haven't had the language to articulate what we're experiencing and what we're feeling. And, you know, I appreciate your podcast for giving voice to this because even right within it, a lot of people don't even know what it means to heal. They don't know why they should be healing because they've only ever known toxic workplaces, right? And so I'm saying, listen, we can't control what our colleagues do. We can't control if Carrie's going to be a bully, if James going to be a bad manager, but we can control how we view ourselves. We can control maybe taking ourselves out of situations. We can control what tools we use to navigate these things, but we first have to acknowledge that they exist. Yeah. One caveat I'll say is when I read both your books, you know, it's sort of, it's a bit triggering and traumatizing to even read these accounts, to read your experience. And so I actually sometimes worry when speaking about their books, your book, as my guest, like when you talk about these experiences, do you have an experience of re-traumatization? I do at times, you know, so I speak a lot, you know, at different companies and conferences and I always get choked up. I mean, it's very rare. Nine times out of 10, I'll get choked up when talking about the carry situation. Not so much for my pain, but because I know that other people have carries, right? Other people are experiencing workplace bullies and trauma. And that's what makes me sad, right? That we have to be talking about these things, that we have to write books to tell people that you didn't do anything wrong, right? This is just, (laughs) this is bad behavior, you know, and we have to eradicate that bad behavior. And so now being in this, you know, for almost five years, I have to take a lot of good self-care, you know, and continue my maintenance strategies to make sure that, you know, I don't let those things define me, but I share them because again, they're not just for me. People need to hear these stories so that we can remove these barriers. To get us sort of into talking about the healing, the healing process, and how you know you're moving in your healing process, I'm wondering if you can briefly summarize, for people that haven't read the book, the Carrie experience and the James experience. Yeah, very long story short. (laughs) Um, So I started talking about Carrie in the memo, and then I talked more deep dive into what I did after those experiences with James and her. But essentially, my Carrie in both books was my workplace bully, if you will. She identified as white and 
she was older than me, more tenured than me. And for some reason, she just was giving a lot of micro and macro aggressions in the workplace. And it started to deteriorate my mental health because, you know, I'd go, for example, I'd go into meetings and I'd start to have panic attacks, even just seeing her face, because every day there was something that she was doing to undermine my work. And I, you know, I had been in weird situations in the workplace, Risa, but I'd never experienced that blatant disrespect, right? It was more subtle up until that point in my career. And I just didn't want to believe that this was racism. I didn't want to believe that she was racist. Like I never even wanted to say that out of my mouth, you know, because I'm like, oh, it can't be that. But what, after you've pointed to everything, you're like, what is it? Right. And so eventually I had to leave that workplace, even after having one of the best monetary goals, uh, you know, hitting the bottom line that I could, but I could not sustain my, my mental health could not sustain that toxicity. And, you know, James was just a, a bad manager. And so when you're inundated with just bad behavior at every turn, it starts to impact how you see yourself. And, you know, I often say in some of my books that by the time I left those workplaces, I didn't recognize myself anymore. That happy go lucky fighter girl who wanted to climb her way up to the ladder, I was picking up pieces of myself as I walked out of the door. And it was healing that has provided, and, and again, I'm not fully healed, but it's a lifestyle. Healing is a lifestyle. But I had to speak my truth because part of the healing is we can't conquer what we're not even willing to confront. And for me, I wasn't even able to call a thing a thing. And so for many years, I never said what Carrie did, right? Never said what James did. And, uh, but we all have a Carrie and we all have a James at some point in our lives or in our career. And again, how can other people be helped if we don't talk about, you know, the behaviors that are showing up in our lives? Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. The specifics, the concrete scenarios that stick out to me that I recall with Carrie, she had invited you to a networking or work event and then proceeded to essentially ignore you the whole time, but then went back the next day and took credit for introducing you to a bunch of people and helping you grow your network when none of that had happened. And then James was someone that was, you were doing stellar work and meeting all your deadlines, but he was basically trash talking you behind your back and undermining your accomplishments with the goal of furthering himself. And one thing I note, and correct me if I'm wrong, is I didn't see you or recall you using the word gaslight. Gaslighting is such a trendy term to use, and I actually don't make light of it. I think it's a great term, and it's undercalled rather than overcalled. Was that intentional to not use the word gaslighting? Yeah, I didn't feel like I needed to use that word because I'm very big on trying to root thing in fact. Not to say that Carrie wasn't gaslighting, that James wasn't gaslighting me, because by the definition that you and I both know, they were very much gaslighting, right? But when I talk about any inequality, I'd like to talk about it in the fact and not the feeling, right? Because often people will say, I feel like so-and-so is gaslighting me. Well, what did they do that made you feel that way, <laughs> right? And so it makes it more real to me to say, yes, Carrie would email you know our managers and ask certain questions about my work. What colleague does that when they don't have anything to do with that, right? Would I'd have host an event and she would call the department I hosted and say, did anybody show up to that event? You know, did Minda do a good job? You know, I'm like, why would your colleague do that? How is that beneficial to the overall goal? <laughs> right? And James came into the situation. He inherited a position that that kind of happened through nepotism in a sense. And he had a lot of kind of disdain for where I was in my career. And he had to lean on me a lot for answers. And instead of doing that, he tried to, you know, kind of sabotage me in ways. And, you know, you get to these places and you're like, is it worth the fight, you know, and, and only each of us can decide how much fight we, we were willing to take. And I felt like through books and advocacy, it was the way to, to get my message out to others. Yeah. And again, everybody has, has a voice. We just have to decide how we want to use it. And that's how I've decided to use mine. I'm Dr. Risa E. Lewis, dropping in to tell you about a book that Dr. Adair Landry and I wrote. It's called Micro Skills: Small Actions, Big Impact. It's a business self-help book being published in April of 2024 by HarperCollins. We believe every future goal, complicated task, and healthy habit can be broken down into simple, measurable, and tiny skills that you can practice and then excel by removing obstacles, overcoming assumptions, and maximizing your potential at work and in life. You can pre-order it now. 
go to bookshop.org, amazon.com, or wherever you buy your books. Two um, fact-based questions and one sort of commentary. I really, again, dug and identified with what you wrote. You said for years you didn't speak. And I'm wondering how many years that was just to sort of quantify like how long you were holding on to this horror, this violence. And number two, healing, percent healing. This is sort of a recent question in that I'm kind of geeky, like zero being unhealed, 100% being totally healed. Would you feel like you could assign a percentage to how healed you feel you are right now? Hmm. I love those questions. So I would say that I didn't realize this when writing right within that I would often say, oh, it was 2015 when I started using my voice, even though I entered the workforce in 2003. So you can kind of do the math on that. So, but my first manager, I write about this in the memo, he made the comment that he saw that I had burnt orange fingernail polish and he said, you people love your bright colors. And he joked around for 15 minutes about how black people like bright colors. I never said anything then, right? I would go on to experience these sorts of slights, if you will, occurrences, racialized offenses <laughs> in many cases. And I didn't think I could talk about it because I had normalized that, you know what, I should just be grateful to be here. I have a good job. You know, if you're black or a woman or you, you sit on certain intersides, this is just how it's going to be for you. You know, so I had accepted that narrative. So I didn't think that I had agency to go to HR or talk about these things out loud until, you know, it really started to impact, you know, my well-being in a, in a really large way. And, and that's when I gave myself that chance. So I would say, uh, maybe, you know, 15 plus, because I, I wrote my young adult book, You Are More Than Magic. And as I was writing that after Right Within, I thought, wow, actually, I've been silencing myself for even longer, right, as a teenager. And so I realized, you know, over uh, you know, 20 years, I probably was, you know, suffering in silence before I gave myself permission to speak my truth. And then the healing question, I always say that healing is not a one-time event. It's a lifestyle. And for me, I'm committed to my healing each and every day because you just don't know when you're going to run into, you know, another Carrie or another James, uh, even as an entrepreneur. And so I would say I'm probably 85%. But when I even wrote the memo, it was probably 60, you know, or 50. <laughs> so it's the journey and the talking and the talking to people like yourself and just having community is what's really helps me lean into my healing more because I know I deserve it. Thanks for sharing that. And the comment I was going to make is the power of writing and putting it out there. I would have experiences, for example, in the workplace, and I would tell a friend about it. It'd be like, that sounds horrible, Risa. And, you know, you'd feel a little bit better because you've gotten it off your chest and it's someone who hears you and you feel heard. And then I started writing. And when I started putting things down on paper and getting them published, people were like, Risa, that's horrible. That happened to you? And I'd be like, I told you that like last month. The power of the writing, the power of the currency of getting things published. Can you speak to that? It's so much power. I didn't even realize how much power it was because I started my blog in 2015, I started July of 2015. I wrote my first blog entry. And so for me, it was like, oh, I don't have to wait on somebody to um, publish this. I could actually start writing. And I built this newsletter and it was called the weekly memo, you know, M memo Mondays. And I'd write about some of this, like low key, some of the stories that I was writing that I'd soon write in my books. And I was just kind of just doing that more so for therapy for myself. But then I realized there were other people who needed this too. And then I thought, wow, okay. Then someone came to me and said, would you mind writing for Fast Company or you know, Time or something like that? And I was like, wait a second. I was okay with the newsletter. I was okay with the MailChimp, right? <laughs> but do, do I want to put myself out here in this larger way? But then again, I realized the power of reclaiming our agency, the power of the narrative. And once I did start publishing my work and sharing it more and getting out of my own way, I just realized how much healing that was causing, how much community that was building. And I don't think that had I not started the newsletter, had I not did some of those opt-eds in you know different publications that I would even have written three books today. I really believe all of that was part of it because it was also validation, Lisa, and maybe you're seeing that too, because we talk about some of these stories and people who have never experienced them like, oh, did that really happen? What? I can't imagine that. And then you realize, wait a second, it didn't just happen to me. It's happened to a whole lot of other people and they're validating the experiences. And that's why we can have books like Right Within and books like The Memo and others to come 
because the validation, right? It's like knowing that there's an audience for it makes it real for a lot of people. Yeah. Okay, let's talk a little about the healing, which I think you really nail in right within in terms of you you give ways to heal as well as how you know you are healing and along a healing process. So I'm wondering if you can highlight some healing techniques that have worked for you. And also I'm interested in what surprised you as like, wow, I never thought this healing technique would help me. And if there's a technique that you're like, wow, I was sure this was going to be for Minda Hearts and then it fell flat. It did nothing for me and I've abandoned it as part of my healing therapy. Part of something that you asked me at the beginning of the show was about success not being a solo sport. And healing is not a solo sport. It can be. There's moments in our lives where we're you know, grieving and mourning certain situations and we're providing healing for ourselves in self-care. But it's also the power of community, right? When I stopped suffering in silence, Teresa, that's when I was able to thrive a little bit more, right? I didn't have to hold the secrets of the workplace, right? I didn't have to hold that on my back and carry that around with me. And I make the joke sometimes of if we don't release the load, we're also going to need not just a therapist, but a chiropractor, right? Because everything is so heavy (laughs) sometimes. And for me, I would say the the number one thing is obviously being connected to, you know, women's groups or support groups in ways where we get to talk about things or networking events around similar topics so that again, you're just validated. So that's worked for me in more ways than one. But then I would also say therapy. And I would say that therapy twofold. Like when I first started therapy, I was under the assumption I would just do these certain sessions and I'd move on with my life. And that was that, right? But (laughs) <laughs> 10 years later, I'm still, it's still part of my tool kit, right? Obviously, I'm not still talking about Carrie and James, but on those moments when I am talking about something or I see a workplace lawsuit that happens to have a woman of color, right? Based off of similar things, those things can be triggering because it's like, man, these things are still happening in the workplace, right? And so having places, soft places to land, right? And I think for me, I grew up kind of socialized to be the strong black woman, right? Never let people see you sweat. And so I didn't realize that vulnerability would be a healing tool of mine too. And it's something that I think is also part of my success is once I was able to let my guard down, let my hair down, be a little more vulnerable and tell my story and more healing took place. And I I thought that I could get through it, not telling all the stories, right? And once you sit down and put your, you know, your pin in your hand or you're you're at your computer, you just start to recall some of the things that you wish you would have been able to shield yourself from. And so I think part of my healing too is helping shield other people and remind them that they're good enough to deserve it, something better, you know, humanity, dignity, equity, and respect. And so I would encourage everybody, regardless if it's race, racial discrimination, you know, gender, identity, whatever that ism is for you to seek support, right? You shouldn't have to suffer alone. Yeah. From what I gleaned, there's the church and the role of faith, therapy, writing, and friendships. Tell us a little bit about the silver dollars and the role friends play in your life. You know, it's funny. My grandmother used to tell me when I was growing up, she'd say, Minda, you think you have all these friends now, but when you get to be my age, you'll be lucky if you can count your good friends on one hand, right? And when my grandmother said that to me at like 13, I'm like, okay, grandma, you know, I'm going to the football games with all my friends. You know, I'm having a great time. I have more friends than I can count. And then you realize as you get a little bit older that your friendships, your true friendships, people you can depend on and trust who don't dismiss certain things, they're such a privilege to have. And along the way, I've met, you know, two that you mentioned, I call the silver dollars, I met them in college. And I'm just so lucky that I had, you know, sisterhood, right? When I hear other women say, I don't get along with other women. It makes me sad to hear that because we need each other, right? We are better together. And, um, and part of the healing, I think that I've done, even when I've experienced inequality from other women in the workplace, I don't let that make me bitter, because I know the power of a good of good sisterhood, of a good friendship. And so having those group texts where you can be like, oh girl, this happened today or, you know, and people just get it. I'm just thankful that, you know, I have that handful of friends that we can always be supportive for each other. And again, back to the community, we don't have to suffer alone and, and we shouldn't because part of, again, is we all have a voice. We just have to decide 
how we want to use it and who we want to tell. I guess I'd like to move towards healing and healing process and how listeners, they're like, gosh, maybe I've been, maybe I'm in a toxic workplace or like, oh, one of my best friends is in a toxic workplace and this is how I've seen them move through it. What are signs and symptoms, if we can get medical to you, that you're like, I'm healing, I'm on a path, I'm much farther along, or as you share, I'm 85%, I'm no longer 50 or 60%. You know, I, I think back to if somebody's asking, am I in a toxic workplace? Think about how you feel the night before, right? We often see, I know online, I see people talk about the Sunday scaries, right? Like you're at home and you know you have to go to work on Monday and you have that anxiety, you feel panicky. That's probably a number one sign that something isn't right at work, right? Something is causing you that to be anxious. And if you're anxious all day at work or ruminating on certain activities or incidents that have taken place. I know for me, I was a former ruminator. I'd be, someone would say something to me like, uh, <laughs> we'll call Chad with the nail polish. And I'd be thinking about that all day long. I take it from one meeting to the next, one meeting to the next, right? Wondering why they said that. And you can't do your best work under that. Amy Edmondson, she coined the term psychological safety. And you can't be safe in an environment where you're constantly questioning, you're constantly on eggshells. So I think if you experience any of that, or if you have like workplace bullying or a manager that just does not get it, I think those are signs that you're in a toxic workplace. And eventually it impacts your health, right? So for me, I started to get the anxiety. I started to get panic attacks. My weight was up and down. (laughs) I couldn't focus. There were just so many different things. And so if work is impacting you in those ways, those are telltale signs that we're not saying quit your job today, but we're saying, you know what, you can't conquer what you're not even willing to confront. And last thing I'll say is for many years, Risa, I couldn't even say it was racism. So how was I going to get to healing if I couldn't even name it? Right. And so we have to be honest with ourselves and we have to be honest with ourselves, right? If we're not able to be honest with ourselves, then we're never going to get to the healing part of the story. Yeah. Sounds like correct me if I'm wrong, you knew you were on your healing path when number one, you could name it. Number two, the symptoms, the ruminations and the physical sort of manifestations started to go away or become much more of a smaller player in your situation. Yeah. I think once, I mean, obviously when I named it, I still had a whole mountain to climb to get to the other side, but it was the first step in my process, right? We all have a process. And I talk about that in Right Within. And my process to heal might be different than yours. Uh, And it's not a cookie cutter, but we all have to start at the acknowledgement. And then the other part of it too, down the line is when I was able to not let certain things bother me as much, right? And totally take me out of my element. So when certain people would say certain things to me, sometimes it would knock me off my whole work day, right? So if I already know that Carrie is going to be Carrie, then I'm going to put up guardrails to make sure that while I'm in this situation, that she's not impacting my mental health every single day, right? And so that's why if you don't have the internal, maybe it's a employee resource group, it's a business resource group, maybe that's the place that you go for support, right? You have a therapist on the outside, you have friends that you can call when these things are happening. And so having your lifelines, you know, there used to be, I don't know if it's still on Risa, but who wants to be a millionaire, right? And they'd offer you all these options for who are your lifelines. And healing is part of tapping in to your lifelines. Your legacy. I just want to make the workplace better than I found it. If at the end of the day, people will add my name to the list of making the workplace better than it was, then I've done my job. Uh, You know, there's not a day that I don't get, you know, several emails from women who find my work, listen to a podcast and say, thank you. I was able to find the courage. I thought I was going crazy. No one understood. Thank you just for letting me for this moment be seen, or I asked for the raise, right? I take all that with me, right? Because that's the only thing I ever wanted to do. I didn't write books because I wanted to be famous. I didn't write books because I wanted to be, you know, a paid public speaker. I wrote them because I just didn't want any more women crying in the car, crying in the bathroom, crying on the couch, right? Because we've worked so hard to get to this place in our career. And We shouldn't have to leave it because of bad behaviors. So if any of my work has helped anybody in that see themselves, then I've secured that seat. Thank you, Minda Hartz. Thank you, Risa. I appreciate you. The Risa Wrap-Up. 
special thanks to Minda Hartz for joining me in conversation. Minda, totally appreciated our conversation, your authenticity, your honesty, and you're putting yourself out there. Listeners, check out Minda's platform. Check out her books. I've read the memo. I read right within. I can't wait to read her next book that's coming out. There's a phrase I really like called life is not a spectator sport. And not only do I believe that, I try to live that. Minda famously says, success is not a solo sport. Not only do I believe that, but I'm going to put that a little further and say that healing is not a solo sport. Minda is the one that exemplifies this. She offers ways and right within on how to heal and some things that you can take home listeners on how you can heal if you think you've had workplace trauma. Well, first of all, if you think you've had workplace trauma, you probably have had workplace trauma. You're not bananas. You're not making it up. And you know what? You're probably not the only one. So things to try, things to consider in no apparent order. And these won't work for everybody. Number one, therapy. Number two, a religious or spiritual practice. Number three, self-care, which includes exercise, good food, spending time with good people. Number four, good people. That means good friends. Surround yourself with people you love and with people that love you. And finally, writing. Think about the power of writing. You can share stories. You can talk about stories. Those are important. But the power of writing for yourself, for other people, for the world, that currency cannot be underestimated. That's what I got for you this week, audience. See you next time. The Visible Voices podcast amplifies voices both known and unknown, discussing topics of healthcare, equity, and current trends. We are a production of the People's Media Network. Our team includes Dr. Giuliano DeCorto and me, Dr. Risa E. Lewis. Please find me on social media at Risa E. Lewis and through the website, thevisiblevoicespodcast.com. If you like the podcast, please rate and review us. Share the podcast with a friend today. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, to be continued.